This week, thousands of mostly peaceful protesters continued marching in Oregon, across the nation, and even around the world to protest police killings of black Americans. But has an organized band of radicals been working to incite property destruction and violent clashes with police at the protests? Welcome to Oregon News and Views from Social Advance. I'm Randy Prince. Charles Dunaway has stepped back from his role as co-host for now and remains a part of the team producing our show. And I'm Alan Zundel. Two weeks ago, we finished our coverage of the Oregon primary elections. We made some mistakes on that episode and invite you to check out our corrections in the comments about the program on our YouTube channel. And two days after that show, George Floyd was killed at the hands of a policeman in Minneapolis, touching off two weeks of protests with no end in sight. The protesters have been mostly peaceful, but property damage, looting, arson, and other serious illegal actions have also taken place during or after the events. Suspicions of a far-flung conspiracy to incite these acts of destruction are being spread by political figures and on social media. Is there anything to them? Here's our report. This Monday, the United States Attorney for Oregon claimed that violent disruptions at protests in Portland were part of a nationally orchestrated effort. He specifically mentioned Antifa groups as involved and said his views were based on information he could not share publicly. The U.S. Attorney, Billy Williams, was appointed by President Trump and his comments echoed those of the president. I am your president of law and order and an ally of all peaceful protesters. But in recent days, our nation has been gripped by professional anarchists, violent mobs, arsonists, looters, criminals, rioters, Antifa, and others. Other officials have made similar remarks. For example, a senior New York City police official in charge of counterterrorism said that anarchists had planned to cause trouble even before the protests started. Again, evidence was not made public. Of course, you don't need a conspiracy theory to explain disruptive actions at protest. When hundreds or thousands of angry, fed up people come together and are all too often met with unjustified police aggression, there's likely to be trouble. And the situation is easily exploited by looters or drunken hellraisers, especially after nightfall. That said, what is the evidence for a widespread organized effort to incite destructive actions? But first, what is Antifa and who are anarchists? Antifa is a shortened version of anti-fascist. In the last few years, it's been used by a loose network of people who want to counter the rise of white supremacists and similar groups. They've been known to act as bodyguards for anti-hate protesters, to disrupt right-wing rallies and speakers, and to assault those they regard as promoting fascism. We don't know of any instances in which Antifa activists have incited violence at protests against racism. It doesn't seem to fit their profile. Most Antifa activists also identify as anarchists, which is a much larger group. As monarchy is a Greek word meaning one person, mono, exercising power, archi, anarchy is a Greek word meaning no exercise of power. Anarchists believe that ordinary people can organize themselves voluntarily and cooperatively and that government structures are a tool for class oppression. Many anarchists engage in peaceful activities like running soup kitchens, swap meets, and cooperatives. Some engage in acts meant to attack symbols of class oppression or expose the true nature of government power. Breaking windows during protests or setting fire to a police station would not be out of character for these anarchists. So what is the evidence that disruptive actions were planned or coordinated? One of the first suspicious events occurred in Minneapolis on Wednesday, May 28th, a day after protests had begun. Acts of vandalism and looting had already occurred the night before, but escalated after this took place. The man breaking the windows of an AutoZone store is clearly engaged in a premeditated action. At first, the so-called umbrella man was identified as a St. Paul police officer. That rumor was based on flimsy evidence, and the St. Paul Police Department said that the officer had been on duty at the time in the presence of other officers. Others have noted that umbrella man is dressed all in black, a signature of anarchist activists. 
but anyone can dress in black. Other videos of Umbrella Man and the man holding a pizza box who confronted him have emerged, including one of vandalism of a nearby police precinct building. The so-called pizza guy has been identified as a trusted local activist, but no one so far has been able to positively identify Umbrella Man, his affiliations, or his motivations. For a good dissection of the evidence, search for Reluctant Habits Umbrella Man. The second suspicious event was first posted in a video on Thursday, May 29th, presumably having been taken the day before. It shows a pallet of bricks lying by a federal courthouse in Dallas, Texas, near where protests were taking place. The video came from the Instagram feed of Ruben Lael, the man addressing the camera. Lael has a media company in Dallas and was participating in the protest. He says in the video the bricks weren't there three months ago and speculates that they were placed there as a setup. After Lael's video went viral, multiple videos and photos of pallets of bricks from around the country were posted online. They were presented as evidence of a coordinated conspiracy to provide bricks for protesters to throw. Then on Friday, May 30th, Dallas police were attacked with a sudden volley of bricks. In the words of the police chief, quote, Everything was peaceful, then all of a sudden, bricks started hailing, hitting our squad car, hitting the officers, end quote. This lent credence to the pallet story. Several of the reports of suspicious pallets of bricks have been investigated and debunked. Some of them were there long before Floyd's death even took place. In another example, a New York City police commissioner claimed a photo of bricks showed them strategically placed for looters. But the city council representative for the area said there were no protests there and the bricks were in the garbage near a construction site. Many and maybe all of these reports of pallets of bricks may simply be a case of people being primed to see ordinary sites as suspicious. Finally, two lawyers were charged for throwing a Molotov cocktail into an empty police car in New York. One is a corporate lawyer, but the other Uruj Rahman is a civil rights lawyer and so presumably has leftish political views. Her mugshot shows her in a black and red t-shirt, colors traditionally used by anarchists. But so far, no connections to anarchism or Antifa have been reported. On the other hand, evidence that right-wing groups have tried to incite violence at the protests is better documented. Last Saturday, three men were arrested in Las Vegas and charged in federal court with conspiracy to commit an act of terrorism. They were caught with firearms and materials for gasoline bombs meant to incite riots at protests in Las Vegas. The men had earlier engaged in anti-COVID lockdown protests there. The complaint stated that they had ties to the Boogaloo movement, a loose network seeking to provoke a civil war in the United States. As documented in an investigative report posted on bellingcat.com on May 27th, the Boogaloo movement is a diverse movement that formed in online message boards. It's now thriving in Facebook groups with thousands of followers. Some participants have urged followers to accelerate confrontations with law enforcement into the expected civil war. Many are Second Amendment activists associated with right-wing militia groups. Neo-Nazis and white supremacists have also joined the movement and tried to co-opt it. For convoluted reasons, Hawaiian shirts have become a symbol of the movement. Armed men, sometimes wearing Hawaiian shirts, have been reported to be present at the current protests. In South Carolina, police arrested a man on charges, including instigating a riot at a protest. The man was wearing a Hawaiian shirt and at one point was standing with a group of men all in Hawaiian shirts. So can right-wing anti-government types be described as anarchists? Well, I guess you could say in a way that uh, right-wingers who are against government are anarchists, because that's what the definition of anarchist is. They're against government. Um, but I've never heard anyone refer to them as anarchists. They don't call themselves anarchists, and anarchists are usually associated with left-wing movements. And certainly they don't call themselves Antifa. That, that has no bearing in this at all. <laughs> well, I, I think the right has learned something from the left, uh, there has been quite a bit of 
uh, government repression. The federal justice system has gone after left-wing radicals in the environmental movement. The uh, Earth First was an example, a loose network. They avoided having any identifiable officers, uh, as little organization as possible, so that they couldn't be prosecuted or sued. Uh, the right has done some of that, but they seem to be a bit more dependent on social media, and so it's a little easier to pick up on them. And uh, I think you heard some government officials saying they had found evidence of their involvement. There's, there's no signs of any kind of nationwide organizing here. What it seems to be is individuals or small groups of people who are engaged in social media bubbles or chat rooms and decide to show up at protests and instigate violence for their own political reasons, um, which aren't the reasons of the people organizing the protests. The, uh, the people who they have arrested have been mostly people who are dressing up, so they're kind of easy to identify with one movement or another, like they're wearing the Hawaiian shirts or they're armed, uh, things like that. Uh, but how do you pick out somebody who's Antifa if they, or, or even somebody who's pretending to be Antifa and dresses in black? I mean, anybody can dress in black, and they all got masks on anyway because of the dangers of the pandemic. So it seems like quite a muddle for anyone to try to sort out who's who and what's really happening. It is. Black is the new black. Uh, <laughs> it is the, the color, the, the, the stylish color these days. And I noted at the local protests here in Eugene, um, a lot of people were wearing black, and it was really not a, obviously part of any costume. Uh, they weren't uh, looking like they were a, a concealed, uh, you know, black-suited person. They just happened to wear black. I, I think the important thing is that in spite of the uh, sabotage of the protest by the uh, those who would try to hijack this for their own purposes to show we're on the verge of civil war that uh, it's around the corner the dissolution of the nation people have recognized the uh, major media institutions and I think people on the street understand with thousands of people coming out not throwing rocks uh, not attacking policemen not looting, not setting fire to things, that there is a legitimate reason for this movement. The number of, uh, of acts that have been committed against black people by law enforcement agents is well, long It is enough. worth re repeating that most of the protests have been nonviolent. And I think as they go along, organizers who were not necessarily experienced at this are learning that you have to watch out for people who are causing trouble and find ways to uh, make sure it doesn't happen. Push them to yes. the side, argue with them, you know, surround them, exclude them, something. It's been seen. People have, been, have witnessed it, reported on it in the news, organizers of protests going after these elements that are doing it. Mm -hmm. In this case, it may not be that in the past, you often found organized you know, police as special departments of uh, police or intelligence agencies would actively work to provoke this. Um, now, it, for some reason, it seems to be people acting on their own to try to subvert the uh, protest movement, but uh, they're not really succeeding. Uh, and uh, this has been a very damaging, uh, politically damaging period for Donald Trump. Uh, having a uh, said he was going to try to step in. Most of his actions are just making things worse for him. And we'll see how long the memory of Americans is when it comes to November. Well, that's gradually becoming a non-controversial statement. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for this week. Join us next week through one of our social media channels, such as YouTube or Facebook, or through the link on the videos page of our website at socialadvance.org. Thanks for watching.